This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. want to welcome you to Real Talk on this beautiful June 29th morning. Ryan Jesperson here with John Hicks. Friends, we need to talk. We need to talk about our justice system. We need to talk about policing. We need to talk about the health of our communities, including infrastructure deficits. And so we have gathered, we have summoned community leaders, mayors, and the council around our Real Talk roundtable. It's a conversation that goes down today. And of course, we'll be talking about what went down earlier this week in Leduc during a council meeting, an unprecedented shutdown that Leduc's Mayor Bob Young talked to us about yesterday. Before we get the ball rolling here, did you know that certified financial planners are earning six figures in Canada? In fact, some of them are starting right around 115 grand a year, and the demand for those skilled professionals is growing fast. You can become a certified financial planner, a CFP with Business Career College, and you could launch your own business, earn great money, and help people achieve their financial goals. Business Career College is the best place to get your CFP with online courses, expert instructors to help you through, and decades of experience helping students succeed. You can get your journey started today. Learn more at Business Career College. Dot com. There seems to be an uptick in this type of protest. Are you seeing the same thing? And if so, what do you think is driving that? Ryan, I have no idea. Like, you know, coming out of COVID, that there's a lot of anger. We're seeing that now. Politics in the States, there's so much hate talk. Now on social media, it's okay to go and just trash people. It's, it's a sad time in our society. For some reason, they think we're infringing on their rights by having a pride flag flying, by doing a crosswalk, by wrapping a bus that says a seat for everyone. We have people that just hate. You've been in politics for quite some time. Has that ever happened before? You ever seen anything like this before? You know, Ryan, I've been in municipal politics for over 18 years. I have never, ever experienced anything like that. It's a very sad day in the history of uh, Leduc Council meetings. That was Leduc Mayor Bob Young talking to us yesterday. You can catch that reel by following us at Real Talk RJ on Instagram, TikTok. And of course, we've got a roundtable today of skilled and experienced community leaders. I'm curious to know how they're going to feel about this. Kathy Heron is the mayor of St. Albert. Krista Gardner is making her Real Talk debut, a counselor in the town of Calmar. And Trina Jones, the mayor of Legal. Good morning to the three of you. Thanks for joining us here. Uh, I know it's the type of thing where, you know, we're, we're all smiling and we're happy and it's nice to gather together. But uh, you could tell, despite his optimism yesterday, uh, Mayor Young's seriously troubled about what went down in their council meeting interrupted on monday by transphobic and conspiracy theory driven rants have you ever experienced anything like that in, in a saint albert council meeting mayor thankfully thankfully absolutely never anything like that i don't think many mayors have and i don't think they sh- should have to prepare for that but i think i know many mayors including myself are now planning for that eventuality because i think it will come to saint albert it will come to legal and calmar eventually we need the ability to turn off the mics and we need security in chambers, which is it's unfortunate. But um, Mayor Young handled it very well. He is the eternal optimist. That guy smiles through everything. But uh, it was it was not a pleasant time for, I'm sure, him and his counselors. Not pleasant no. for him, not pleasant for his counselors. And, and obviously a, a blow to the reputation of the city, too, which sucks. Right. It's not the it's not the it's not the, the way that you want to see your city in mm-hmm. the news. Uh, Councillor Gardner, you ever experienced anything like that in in Calmar, whether it's either a council meeting being interrupted or or even maybe an unruly member of the public approaching you while you're grocery shopping? (laughs) Unruly while you're grocery shopping, to be honest, yes. But I think that's the life of small town uh, politicians. You see your people everywhere, right? That I walk down the street, that's where I get the most complaints. We actually get quite a lot, and I'm I'm sure Trina can agree with this, um, conspiracy type people coming to our council meetings because... There's one in every community who come and want to talk about what they're concerned about. And a lot of times it is, I'm, I'm, Kathy's looking at me, 15 minute cities. Yeah. We've gotten a lot of that. I keep saying, we're not even a city, we're a five minute town. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Everything can fit. You can walk from one end of Calmar to the other within 10 minutes. I don't know why we're worried about doing those kinds of things. 
Um, so not necessarily around pride, but definitely around some of those conspiracy type things. Yeah, we've seen that in Calmar. How about you, Mayor Jones? Thankfully, most of my residents are very good people and very, very much understand issues. Uh, we do have a few uh, that may want to make certain opinions known uh, that the rest of the town doesn't agree with. Um, they're not out, as outspoken as in the larger cities, thank, thankfully, uh, but on social media maybe. Uh, with, oh, coming out of the last couple of years, they're a little more amped up, a little more conspiracy theory and... Uh, Unfortunately, we do have to prepare and we do have to uh, deal with that eventuality. Yeah, I mean, when you guys, when you talk about preparing and dealing with it, uh, and, and maybe you don't want to pull back the curtain on everything, but you mentioned you said you need the ability, like Mayor did and Leduc, to, to shut down the mics, to mm -hmm. go into recess, and then to go to in camera, which I think most people know means the public's out and the meeting happens with just the council there right uh, and administration um security there's been no security at council meetings up until this point i mean that's, that's what it sounded like in leduc as well i remember edmonton made the move you remember that when the uber stuff was going yeah. sideways and angry cab drivers were and, and actually by the way i don't blame the cab drivers for being super pissed off for a lot of them they lost hundreds of thousands of dollars but i digress uh, it was really heated and that was when they started putting up that glass you remember that in edmonton yeah. that was kind of a step that they took a number of years ago go uh, this is something being considered in, in communities across the I province think you think when you have a controversial issue you will bring in rcmp or, or just even building security for something like that but on monday's agenda for leduc i don't think there was anything leduc does have a very loose and free public process public commentary process bob I've said that yesterday i've tried to talk to bob uh, narrowing it down and kind of putting some controls around that most of us are um allow for five minutes and you have to register and you have to stay on topic and uh it, in Leduc in the, with the fire um issues that they've been having it's been going on for a, over a year that they've had member of the public after member of the public just come in and so as you you saw if you watch the full video when the public commentary in Leduc starts the staff get up and leave their city manager has said i'm not subjecting you to the kind of cruelty that you're that our public are presenting and so the staff are out council has to stay and the city manager leaves but i want to also point out that a lot of these people aren't residents of those communities mm. we we had a conversation before the camera started rolling of where that guy was from we thought was he from grand prairie because it was similar names and um westlock just painted their first pride crosswalk on the weekend they were expecting protesters they had one uh, which was nice to see there was only one and he was from calgary so there is a coordinated effort around 15 minute cities around pride stuff that they they rally and they move around and so i don't even know if those two people even lived in leduc so leduc should not be embarrassed the majority of people in most communities are strong supporters of pride yeah and i'm yeah. certainly not saying that the people of leduc nope. should be embarrassed nope. i'm just saying but you talk to reputation yeah. sometimes should, yeah. you know something like that happens i mean we see it all the time i mean i'm a i'm a proud albertan and every once in a while you're like pete's sake alberta <laughs> Like, we're, we're, not the national, doing us any we're in the national news again. And well, why can't we be talking about the innovation that's happening and the AI steps that are being taken forward and what communities are doing to build more inclusive structures? And, you know, I mean, that's kind of the purpose of our conversation today. I want to reference Kurt Phillips. I think most people know Kurt. He's been on the show before. Uh, he, he's uh, part of the anti-racism Canada movement. You can check out his Twitter account at ARC Collective. That's A-R-C Collective. And he's got a thread here that, that I think is, is worth paying attention to. He put this out last night. He says, this council meeting in Leduc went south yesterday when a group of, of anti-LGBTQ conspiracy promoters led by Phil Red Dog McDavid uh, turned, into a, uh, turned the meeting into a bigoted farce. He says, if the name McDavid is familiar, it's because of this reason. And then, of course, you'll remember Elliot McDavid. Elliot McDavid was the guy that confronted Deputy Prime Minister Christian Freeland at the elevator at the uh, was it a hospital or a health clinic in Grand Prairie? Remember that calling mm -hmm. the deputy PM, a, you know, I mean, a whole bunch of names and, and just, you know, working, I guess, to intimidate her and, and whatever he felt he accomplished. I guess he was pretty proud of himself. So Phil McDavid, I don't know if it's Elliot's brother or related to him, but he's a QAnon guy, a flat earther. 
who believes vaccines are killing people, that the fires in Canada, the wildfires are a government conspiracy. Uh, he was involved in the Coots blockade. He's a Chris Sky supporter. Uh, Chris Sky is the guy who just got his ass handed to him in the Toronto mayoral race. Um, and so Elliot, his brother, appears to be a supporter of the Take Back Alberta movement. They're, they're of course, taking credit for getting Danielle Smith elected as premier. Um, Elliot describing Smith as a good girl. Interesting take, way to describe the premier of your province. Uh, but Phil believes that, you know, people are, are, are working with Danielle Smith to save the province from the boogeyman that he believes is out to get us. Uh, he here, and you can see in this Twitter thread, announced, the, uh, did, quote, Red Dog McDavid, that he would be attending the meeting in Leduc. He asked people to be there and support him. Um, and, of course, there was a gallery there. You notice that, yep. that he, you know, the gal that was talking, uh, Laurel, gleaned a lot of applause when she started talking about uh, necrophilia and bestiality relating to the pride flag. Can you imagine if people hadn't heard of this story and they're hearing me describe this right now? They're going, what is going on? I mean, that's been the reaction for everybody. But yeah, he goes on and he talks about chemtrails. He talks about how the government is spraying the trees, which is starting the fires, not climate change. And, and the, those chemicals, the chemtrails are turning men into women as well. <laughs> Uh, so th this just kind of gives you a sense of, 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 of how this guy's wired, of how these folks are wired to bring it back to what I think makes this more serious and demands our attention is that, you know, these are folks that are because of our conviction of how the democratic process needs to work, given the mic. Given an opportunity to talk, given an opportunity to, to essentially confront <laughs> elected officials. And you got to wonder how long that's going to last. I, I honestly believe that everyone has the right to speak at council chambers or, or to their MLA or MP. That, that I get. Until you bridge over into hate speech and misinformation. The light blue and the light pink and the white on the progress flag are about trans and non-binary. The Black and the brown are about people of color and marginalized people. It's not about necrophilia and sleeping. It was well, any person with half a brain. You need to shut that down. The mayor needs to stand up and say, "You are actually telling mistruths in my chambers, and I do, will not allow that." So, yes, freedom of speech for sure. Until you are bordering on hate speech and misinformation, then it has to be shut down. And, and, and you got to navigate something like this delicately and carefully as well, because number one, uh, you know, for even your own preservation of your political career, but also just because you, you, you would consider yourself to be a decent person. I mean, I, I take swipes. I'm a talk show host. I'll call them how I see them. But, but elected officials aren't as likely to call someone a fool or conspiracy theorist or to brush them off. Uh, and and you got to be careful, too, like Mayor said, about just clamping down and shutting down public debate. I mean, then all of a sudden you're edging toward a completely different type of governance, which is what nobody in Canada wants, right? I think one of the things here, we have my, my personal philosophy around this, um, Calmar has a very active rant and rave community <laughs> um, that usually tends to be ranting, I guess, rather than raving. But I, people are welcome to your opinion, I guess. And, and my feeling is as soon as you step into misinformation, I have an obligation to step in and correct that because this, the silent majority, the vast number of people there aren't complaining, they're just reading the stuff. And if you don't correct it, they start to think that maybe it's true. And I think we really saw that with COVID and, and with misinformation and things like that, that as soon as you give it a platform, it, it looks real or maybe there's some substance behind it. And so you're, you're welcome to your opinion. I'm, I'm more than happy to tell you why I agree or disagree, but, but if you're telling things that are blatantly untrue, we have an obligation, I think, to step in and, and correct that mm, yeah we got some comments here i mean we got a whole bunch of comments our live chat is fiery today on on youtube and we sure appreciate that but uh you know i mean you know for example how about this from jillian she's an educator she says i know a principal that's got to have security at their school council meetings you know she says folks are getting cray here uh had this from shalane shalane says i live in leduc i've lived here my whole life the disgusting rant does not represent the city that I know, and I sure don't think that they were actual Leduc residents. I would say Bob Young represents that community, and I would say he represented them well yesterday here on this show. Uh, if you missed it, make sure you check out that interview. Um, you, you can let us know, yes, and people are referencing that that uh, that moment at Edmonton City Council, that, that era at Edmonton City Council uh, when Uber was kind of barging its way in and, uh, and the impact that that had on, on, on debate and otherwise. Some comments here as well, people just talking about social media. How social media, perhaps, is, is generally speaking responsible for, for creating an environment where maybe people are kind of less inclined or less interested to hear each other out, to dialogue 
where people sit behind a keyboard and make pronouncements. Did, have you seen an evolution there, Trina? Like, do you see that <laughs> happening? You, you've got this kind of like, <laughs> kind of like smirk on your face. I feel like the comment resonated with you. Uh, a, a little bit, yes. Um, I think it leads to a degradation of the dialogue. Like Krista mentioned, the misinformation, the hate speech, the... <laughs> Um, just general confrontational nature of social media lately. It, it's frustrating. It's scary. Um, and, and we're moving into a place where you can post anonymously. You can post with fake accounts. It, and, and if you can't put your name behind something, maybe you shouldn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, 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 I think it's a lost opportunity. In 2010, when I first read, social media was a great way to reach out to yeah. the residents. I had to do my coffee with Kathy's and we have conversations and stuff. But you're, you're going to, if you could count, you, you'll start seeing politicians, especially, backing away. Um, Lisa Helps was the mayor of Victoria. She said the best last three years of her political career because she got off social media. It's, it's, it's a lost opportunity. And mm. it's, it's really a shame because it's, it's a great way to reach a large audience quickly. But I'm, I don't go on very much anymore. I will just throw out stuff, but I don't encourage the back and forth. So you said you were trying to correct misinformation. I oh. used to do that. And then you get a back and forth dialogue of, and, and it's bitter and it's fighting and nobody believes you because you're a politician. So I just like, screw it. Yeah. yeah. Um, Lauren, uh, a regular audience member of ours, is a former district fire chief. Can I just throw <clears throat> one at you here that he has a comment? I know yeah. nothing about this. Yeah. He says, good on St. Albert. Uh, reversing its decision to get rid of its uh, emergency dispatch system, a life-saving decision versus a money decision. What's he referencing? So uh, it, during COVID, the city of St. Albert, I'll make this quick, did a big review of how we could save some money and find efficiencies. One of the recommendations was to contract out our fire dispatch. We made the decision thinking we were going to save some money. Uh, when the when the RFPs came back to do that contract, it didn't result in a lot of savings and so i think council was very happy to re reverse that decision we have an integrated fire uh, ambulance in st albert so we have four dispatchers that are dispatching fire trucks quite often to replace an ambulance because ambulances we can get into community health care right now with talk about ambulances Let's but in st albert um yeah we kept our fire dispatch because they're and it was a great moment actually in chambers we had um uh the uh, widow of a of a ambulance driver come in and speak to her experience when her husband commits suicide and she, we also had a young child who slipped through a um, thin ice on a storm pond and was underwater and the ambulance is nowhere to be found so the fire truck got there and it was a remote area that no one there's no address so the kid on the phone was trying to tell the dispatcher and because they were local dispatchers they knew St. Albert quite well yeah. they knew exactly where that storm pond was and they got there in time and the kid was in chambers telling his story the kid lived he did and his mother was there and now I'm the mayor <laughs> and I'm like chills. Oh, I, oh I was weeping it was it was a great moment um, and I love my integrated uh, fire department and I love my fire service so there's been a lot of yeah. talk around the province of, of how emergency services should be dispatched and um, we're going to be talking about policing today as well and so give us uh, an opportunity to get into this if you're just joining us uh, live streaming audio on the Mixler audio app presented by California Closets we're talking to uh, that was Mayor Kathy Heron out of St. Albert uh, Krista Gardner is a counselor out of the town of Calmar and Trina Jones is the mayor of Legal. I love seeing people jump like Shalane to defense of their community you know and uh, I have a quick message here for those of you that call Edmonton home uh, you know that you love your city but that's obvious and civic service Service Union 52 has more than 6,000 members uh, that are working to build in Edmonton with great services, libraries, rec centers, clean water, responsible energy. Uh, they are behind the scenes to make sure that your city works so that high demand services are right here around the clock. CSU 52 members are dedicated to an Edmonton that you can count on, an Edmonton that's inclusive, vibrant, connected. CSU 52 and Edmonton for everyone. You can check out Edmonton for everyone dot CA. Speaking of California closets, I know everybody, when you think of California closets, you may have a friend that, that looked to them for a, a custom closet design or maybe an entertainment center like we did to get everything organized in our main family room. But you know they do garages as well, right? Uh, the garage is the workhorse of your home, but a lot of people don't have the garage working for them. 
You know, you've got your extension cords and your garden hoses just laying on the floor right next to the hockey skates, and, and then you're tripping over the rake, and the snow shovel is behind the bike pump, and you're just like, it's an absolute mess. Am I speaking right to you? Uh, California Closets with a free consultation can design a, a garage workbench or a functional setup for your space, your garage that may be neglected up until now. A personalized and integrated workspace maximizes efficiency, square footage, and your sense of personal satisfaction in a job well done. You can get your quote today at californiaclosets.ca. We wanted to remind uh, professional engineers, uh, hey, maybe this show dropped in your lap. Maybe somebody shared this episode with you because of something our mayors, our counselors are saying, but Maybe deep down inside, all you're thinking about right now is your desire to find new employment. You're bored stiff at your engineering firm. You're not challenged. There's no career progress and you don't feel appreciated. Apex Automation wants to talk to you. They're hiring right now all kinds of engineers plus electricians, instrumentation professionals, all folks who are interested in working in the next phase in industry 4.0 working on projects that represent the future of where industry is going autonomous vehicles machinery advanced process controls robotics you name it apex automation is leading the way uh, based out of bc alberta saskatchewan heck they just opened a field office in houston texas if you're a new engineering grad and you're looking to start off your career on the right foot don't delay check out apexautomation.ca today and a quick note to all those animal lovers out there if your dog or cat is maybe this time of year uh showing signs of allergies maybe their their paws appear to be kind of itchy maybe something's off with their coat they just don't seem to be themselves you might find the solution today at granddog.ca we feed our dogs grand dog essentials quality raw food but we also use their supplements and this is where you can find help for your dogs or your cats just go to granddog.ca click on the shop now link and you'll be able to find all kinds of supplements heck what can fermented goat milk do for your dog or cat check it out learn more on the blog link and don't forget if you're living in calgary edmonton or central alberta they'll deliver right to your door promo code real talk knocks 10 percent off your first time order at granddog.ca we can learn a lot about people by their pets trina are you a, are you a pet person or do you have like a full-blown farm what's your situation more of a funny farm, but, uh, you know, no, we have a, a 90 pound boxer named Indy. Oh, you do. Yes. We have a 90 pound boxer named Moses. <laughs> I just shaved that down. He's like 105 pounds, but he, he's well, 90 he, he used to best. be a little chunkier, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our boxer's the best. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Krista, do you have a, do you have, are you an animal person? You're an animal lover? Um, I am. <clears throat> we, we have a dog. Um, he's a Westie. His name is Angus. Um, cause he's Scottish. So he needed a Scottish name. Angus. <laughs> Angus. Yeah. <laughs> Mayor? Oh yeah, we have a we have a, I don't know, eighty pound golden doodle named Boomer. Yeah. Who, when I do coffee with Kathy, I think people tune in to see Boomer more than they see me. Yeah. The golden doodles are like the, the, the if, if I were Zoolander, I would say it's so hot right now. Just Everybody's into the golden there, doodles there, right yeah. now, right? Their demeanor is absolutely amazing. Hey, let's talk about healthy communities. Um, there's a great campaign that uh, Alberta municipalities has rolled out, and, and people can check it out for themselves at AB Munis. Dot ca and we'll link to that in the show notes uh, on the podcast on youtube but but it's time to talk that's the campaign it's time mm -hmm. to talk about justice and policing and and infrastructure deficits uh, why don't we start with public safety because that for a lot of people is priority number one right now we talked to edmonton councillors cartmel and knack just the other day and that was one of the things they wanted to make sure we address was downtown safety what's the policing reality as we look across the different alberta municipalities what's one of the number one issues that you're focusing on as president of alberta municipalities uh, response time, and, and you might want to turn to my two rural colleagues here, but for sure our, we need to understand and we need a decision from the provincial government on their direction on provincial policing, whether they're going to keep the RCMP or whether they're going to go down the road of provincial policing. I need, we need a decision on that one because we, we're going to have to transition when, if, we, if they move. So that is huge. We have been calling for a public safety task force, we call it. They did it in Edmonton, they did it in Calgary, but the rest of us have not been included in this conversation about public safety um, in general. So, you know, what are we doing for the justice system to keep some of these uh, criminals in jail that are 
re- repeat reoffending. And you'll you'll find that it's a lot of the crime is done by a, a small five or ten percent of criminals. So they get released, and there's lots of stories we could tell. The biggest one that we quite often refer to was the fellow from Alberta Beach that ended up in Edmonton and and killed somebody. So that guy should have stayed behind jail. So that's the justice system. But there's also the root causes. Driving down to your office today, you know, you, you do drive by encampments and mental health issues and addictions. And that makes people feel unsafe in the downtown core of Edmonton. If those root causes of crime could be dealt with, instead of just putting more boots on the street to to react to the crime, I think we would be better off. But I think my rural colleagues would probably have a really good perspective on what crime is like and what your response times are like and how you can get RCMP to respond. It, it's a big province. Yeah, right? well, Councillor Gardner, what, can, can, can you take us to Kalmar, so to speak? Can you, can you give us a sense <laughs> of, of what, what the There's reality looks like there. right there? I mean, what's, what, what's public opinion right now? What are, what are some of the, what we might call the anecdotes that you see that kind of tell the story as best you know it? You know, Kalmar's not really rural. We're 10 minutes west of Leduc, um, but but our people do consider ourselves to be rural, right? And and so as far as like being being way out far away from a police station, that's not really the case, but we're serviced through Leduc Detachment out of Leduc. They go all the way out past New Sarepta on one side and then past Kalmar on the other side. And we're probably lucky if we get a 30 minute response time. We are... I mean, for the most part, for minor crimes, um, people say, why even bother calling the police? They're not going to come. And mm. they're just going to tell you to go into the office and file a report. And so, and so we've had a really hard time with that with um, people calling our peace officer and that not really being his job. His job isn't actually to investigate crime or to deal with some of these kinds of things, to go to domestic violence incidents. Um, but that's the person who's around. And that's the person who, I mean, within Kalmar, there's nowhere you can't be in a car within three minutes, <laughs> especially if you, you put the lights on and you really lay on it. Um, so, so we see that where we're picking up the stuff and he's going outside of his scope and that's an, an issue for the town that we don't want to be dealing with that kind of stuff, right? But if the police aren't there, what do you do? And, and so that's a real thing where, and then the police say to us, they're only going to come more to Calmar and spend more time in Calmar if they have the statistics to back it up, but people don't feel like it's worth even calling the police right. when the statistics aren't there. So it's this real. Um, are you are you being serious about a mm-hmm. thirty minute response time? Yeah, I, I you know, like I if mean, I, I say someone's trying to kick down my front door, it's going to be thirty minutes till a, a squad car arrives or more. Yeah, if I I think I mean we've had some incidents in town where, if, you know, in a theoretical, if someone said, oh, there's someone with a gun at the school, police would be there much faster, right? Uh, but but for things that they don't consider to be like really really high eminent risk i mean you would be lucky like i'm like there's somebody in my garage breaking into my house this was a couple of years ago they were like we'll swing by in a couple of hours <laughs> and my husband was like i'm gonna go get a bat and i was like please don't do well, that but that is, that <laughs> is what people would or, do exactly or, or let the 100 pound boxer out right yeah. or, or whatever and 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 people saying things like i mean we are we are con- rural our people feel rural most houses probably do have firearms in them most people that i know hunt um, I, I, and, and there are lots of people like the talk is always, I'm going to defend my property. I'm going to defend my family. I'm going, and, and I really would hate to see Kalmar to get into a situation where, where that kind of thing happens, right? Because we feel, and, and I think the RCMP would maybe have a different story behind what that is and why it looks like that. But our people feel like they're not receiving the service that we're paying for. And, and they really feel unprotected and things like that. And I think that some of this goes back to that, that piece about social media and the rise of anger and, and all of that stuff that you have all of these things then where you feel like your government structures aren't serving you. And, and so when it comes to policing, it can get really hairy, I guess, <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you ask people about it. Alberta Municipalities has, has, has some statistics available, which I think is always interesting to know how members of the public are feeling, what members of the public say. So uh, six out of 10 Albertans, 61% feel that crime is increasing in their part of the province. 65%, let's say two out of three, uh, believe that investing more in the, our justice system will stop repeat offenders. Uh, And about that same number, 67% of Albertans feel replacing the RCMP with provincial police 
will not reduce crime. Uh, Mayor Jones, have you? I mean, obviously, you're talking to your constituents in Lacal all the time. Like we said, at the gas pump, at the grocery store, walking your dog, whatever the case may be. Do, do you get a sense? Is there is is there consensus as far as you can tell on how people feel about how policing should be approached and funded and rolled out? A lot of the people that I talk to, they want more funding for the police. That's pretty much bottom line. They want more boots on the ground. They want the services when they need them. They want somebody to show up. Uh, the problem is, is our detachment's in Warrenville. So again, 20, 30 minute response time. And they cover everything out from Bonacord and Gibbons out to Alexander First Nation, north end of St. Albert, out to Legal. It's a huge area. So they may not be in our neighborhood right away. Um, the provincial side of that detachment only has 15 officers um, total. <laughs> so that's maybe four or five on shift at any, at any given time. The commander out there has basically told his officers, you're not to be in the detachment. We'll take care of your paperwork. We have admin staff for that. You're going to be on the road so you can improve these, okay. these response times. He's very active on this. He comes to talk to our council all the time. Uh, so he's putting in some great initiatives on that. But yeah, going back to Krista's point, um, the old Ralph Klein, shoot, shovel, and shut up yeah. is becoming very, very real, real in the rurals. <sighs> Yeah, and and we and, and we've seen it with with tragic consequences, Absolutely. and and there have been sort of racially charged elements to some of those stories. But you have landowners, you have sometimes contentious relationships between communities, uh, right? And and uh, and and obviously it, it winds up being a bit of a nightmare. Is the vi is the feeling is the conviction that that a that a move to a provincial police service for Alberta will automatically be a bad move? I mean, I've talked to. Some elected officials that, that believe it's the right move. I've talked to some people who think that that's absolutely the direction uh, where we should go. Mayor Heron, what's your conviction and how have you reached that place? I think um, it doesn't matter what stripe is on the pant of your police service, whether it's provincial police or RCMP. I, I would 100% say that the RCMP need to modernize some of their processes. And I think a lot of the conversations that's happened in Alberta and some of the other provinces that are considering moving away from RCMP has forced the RCMP to modernize. It's awesome to hear that Trina's detachment commander is saying, get out of the detachment, we'll do your paperwork, you need to be on the streets. That That's that's modernized policing. Uh, we want we just want to have a say as mayors on, on what the priorities are. and, and you know, are we going to focus on youth? Are we going to focus on that 10% of crime? But that's my decision as a mayor i don't want that decision to be made by the province so i think our, our one of our objections to the proposed model for alberta provincial police was we didn't know where our say would be they talked about commissions but who's appointing to those commissions am i or is the province who you know who chooses the detachment commander who responds to complaints All, none of those questions have been answered and until those are answered we are firmly saying we'll we, we'll take the rcmp plus there's a huge financial cost to transition away from rcmp it's like we get about 80 million dollars treated not if i'm wrong because she's really on this file uh, about 80 million dollars from the federal government uh, 180. 180, thank you and then it was over 300 uh, million to transition and i think that's low so take that money and invest in addictions mental health and justice that's that's what we've been saying for a long time and then then we can make a decision if the rcmp is right for alberta or not okay by the way we should note uh, i mean of, of interest today is alberta's finance minister uh, nate horner is going to be releasing the annual fiscal report and i, I think that uh, people would be right to brace themselves a little bit um mm -hmm. th these types of things don't necessarily impact people's everyday lives but it gives a sense of where the the government's at um it, with its budget and whether we're looking at a surplus or a deficit and those types of things and and of course in this province of alberta a lot of that has to do with where the price of oil is at so we'll have we'll have uh, more light shone on this and these numbers a little bit later on in the day but but with a new government as well a new provincial government comes comes that that uh, the onus i suppose on municipalities to establish in some cases obviously existing relationships but to nurture new relationships as well and 
and to come, I suppose, in a spirit of partnership and collaboration and uh, in layperson's terms, to ask for a bunch of money to try to, fi <laughs> to, try to fix things in the community, right? I mean, I'm, I'm oversimplifying it and being a bit glib about it, but, but what impact does a, does a new provincial government have on some of these community initiatives and, and actually trying to uh, have theory be put into practice and, and make improvements? You know, I, this is, I mean, it is a new government. It's we, not an entirely Rick, new government. Rick McIver back, and, which and, is and we're really happy to have Rick McIver back as the, the Minister of Municipal Affairs. We have a longstanding relationship with Rick. He has a background as a city councillor. Um, so he understands a lot of the issues. Um, I mean, that being said, when we go and ask for money, that doesn't necessarily always translate into dollars, right? <laughs> um, in, our, you know, in our area, we have a brand new MLA. Our, our previous MLA didn't run again. So now it's about educating him about what our needs actually are, how we'd like him to go forward and advocate for our area to the rest of, to the rest of the caucus, to the government. And, you know, see, see how, you know, we build those relationships. We're building relationships with other, so if there's new ministers, those types of things, but yeah. We're working on it. Have you met with, uh, like, in the, in the context of Alberta municipalities, have you met with Premier yet or senior cabinet ministers, or how does that work? It goes back to our campaign. It's time to talk. Yeah. Uh, Premier Smith, when she first became leader last fall, she, she gave direction that all co communication for municipalities need to go through the municipal affairs minister, which was Rebecca. And we did establish a great relationship with Rebecca. I'm super glad to see her still in cabinet on the environment fire she'll do great uh, i i i would like to see the premier at my board table that's what we need to see it, along with the minister of municipal affairs but the premier really needs to understand uh, that we are a duly elected order of government you just said that these things decisions don't affect our everyday lives and i'll disagree if no you, i'm just saying yeah, like the average person yeah. in the suburbs today's fiscal update isn't going to change what they have for supper that's true but if the federal government was to stop working you might not notice for this is, we hear this all the time you might not notice for a couple months if the provincial government was to stop working you might not notice for a couple weeks if our level of government stopped working you would notice by supper sure because your garbage wasn't picked up or your snow p wasn't cleared and that and we rely so heavily on provincial dollars to get us to do those services. So that fiscal update will impact um, their decisions on how they fund municipalities. A hundred percent, absolutely, and it's a very fair point. I wanna talk about social supports in just yep. a second, um, because when, when, when you talk, Mayor Heron, about root causes, like it's very interesting, right? We say a lot of people think that crime will be solved just by more boots on the ground, um, and you say, but we need to talk root causes, and, and that's true. Um, and then you, Mayor Jones, say, well, we need more boots on the ground because we only have four officers on shift to cover how many square kilometers. And, and you're not wrong. You're 100 percent right. And what's probably correct or accurate is that we probably need both. Yeah. Um, and that, of course, costs more money. So why don't we talk root causes uh, in just a second? First, I'll remind you that these conversations happen because we have Real Talk sponsors that believe in the importance of Real Talk, that understand what community is all about. And, and that completely describes the ownership group group at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. These are family-owned locations in Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, Baseline Road. Families like the, the Liebers and the Cardinals that, well, they, they value their communities and they give back. It was amazing to see them out in support of our Real Talk Golf Classic just last week. I want to remind you, if you're going to be either throwing or attending a Canada Day festivity, uh, some sort of an outdoor party this weekend, you can kick those July 1st festivities up a notch with a Canada Day cake from DQ, complete with customizable design. You want to make fun of your buddy on an ice cream? cake. It's the best way. It's the coolest way to do it. Can't help myself. The red and white frosting, of course. Talk about elevating your tablescape. The classic DQ dessert adds way more fun to an already awesome day. You can pick one up ready to go or order yours custom from a Dairy Queen in Northwest Edmonton or Sherwood Park. We're talking about the Baseline Road location. Along that Canada Day prep line, I'll also remind you that for the 16 Alberta communities that of are lucky enough to have a Friesen Brothers, or those of you that are close enough to travel to hit up a Friesen Brothers, they've got you covered for Canada Day. Uh, June is pork month, and so they've got amazing specials ready to go from their real Friesen Brothers butchers. They've got their custom in-house barbecue sauce. 
it's the best on the market as far as I'm concerned. And they've also got a bunch of cool stuff like Canada Day hanging baskets and fresh BC-grown uh, flower bouquets. I mean, it's your one-stop shop to get set for this long weekend. Friesen Brothers, for more than 65 years, has been Alberta-grown and Alberta-owned. We're going to be sharing with you through the summer updates on our backyard reinvention. We're trusting this to the team at Eden Landscaping. And I've been talking to you about them for, for quite some time with Eden. And, and my impression of how Eden operates was based on people that had hired them before. Well, now it's firsthand. And when I say to you, this is a team that can take a vision and turn it into reality and they can work on a budget. I mean it because that's what we've been seeing them do. These are custom landscaping services, full project management. That's what you get when you work with Eden Landscaping. You're not having to call the excavator. You're not having to wonder if the, the soil guy is going to get back to you or the people working on that retaining wall are ever going to return. Uh-uh. Eden's got you covered. Their philosophy and exceptional landscapes got to be a thoughtful, flowing vision. They can bring your vision to life, and that starts with a consultation today. You can find them online at Landscape Edmonton. Ca. And while we're talking about building, we want to give a big shout out. You probably know by now how excited we are to be in this new studio in Mercer Warehouse. There were some real challenges that came with building this place out. I mean, John Hicks, the technical producer, had a big, bold vision on how digital and modern this space was going to be. But I mean, this warehouse used to be where they were making GWG jeans like decades ago. They used to make bitters in this room. There was a stubborn water leak that was coming down right where our big, expensive cameras are. The team at Complete Care Restoration to all of that said, don't worry about it. And we watched them figure it out problem solved by problem solved by problem solved. Now, right now, a lot of their work is helping people get back on their feet from fire damage and flood damage. If that's you, number one, we're thinking about you. Number two, the first move and the best move you can make is to get in touch with the team at Complete Care Restoration, either online via the sponsors link on our website or by giving them a call, 780-454-0776. We're proud to partner with the team at Complete Care Restoration. It's time to talk. That's the invitation from Alberta municipalities. They want to talk to the provincial government, and they want to talk to you as Albertans living in, in, in smaller, medium-sized, and even the big communities. You can check out their advocacy campaign at abmunis.ca. When we kickstart a conversation on social supports, uh, Trina, obviously, you're, you know, you're, you're based out of Legal. That's the community you represent, but I know you're a passionate Albertan as well. Where would you like to see that conversation start? I, I think we've all identified the root causes of crime, the homelessness, the mental health issues, addictions issues. And I think that's probably where we need to start. Uh, unfortunately, a small, rural, remote we don't have the resources. Uh, we have an FCSS person who maybe doesn't, you know, uh, half of her desk is FCSS, half of it's rec, and then the other half is whatever else is going on. Is that family, child, social support? Is that what that is? Yes. FC okay. Yeah. So what we're finding is our FCSS people are, are a little overworked. They're trying to refer these people maybe to the police who really that's not their job you can't arrest your way out of an addiction <laughs> it doesn't work that way um so what she's having to do is refer these folks into the larger centers the st albert's the edmonton's the, uh, wherever those supports are available so localizing them where pe we can pe keep people in town around their support network around their families and have them have that backup i think would help solve well i'm, I'm probably not solve but would help that issue a lot and, and really get our people feeling it and, and understanding the issues. Do you see a, a social support deficit counselor in, in Calmar uh, on, a, on a regular basis? I mean, is, is this something that's readily apparent to you as you walk the streets of your community? You know, we're in the same sort of situation as, as Trina. We have an FCSS person who works two days a week. Um, we work in partnership in a regional model with Leduc County, with Devon, with Beaumont going around. Um, but I mean, for sure, affordable housing is an issue in our community. For sure, there are, I mean, and, and it's tough in a small community because there is really a couple of, of people, right? So it's hard to kind of point some of that out. But, but drug issues, uh, minor crime related to drug issues, 
that kind of thing absolutely is is happening in our small towns across the province. It's not just Kalmar or Legal. That's that's all over. And I think a lot of times people think homelessness is only an issue in Edmonton and Calgary. It's not. It's become a major issue in our mid-sized cities um, and even in smaller places. But they tend to not necessarily stay uh, like in Kalmar because it's so easy to go to Leduc. And so now you are seeing like lots of homelessness issues in Leduc, um, in St. Albert, in Spruce Grove. I don't know, Kathy, if you want to talk about what that Almost, looks like. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I'll just add that FCSS, Family Community Support Service, is a, is a funding from the province that needs to be increased. Well, we're going to talk about money a, a lot, yeah. but the premier actually leaned over to me in April. We were at a lunch together and she said, I love FCSS and you need to convince my cabinet to raise it because they only raised it by $5 million. It was the first time it had been raised in five years. But that money goes a long way. And when you don't have it, municipalities are investing in trying to cover that gap so your property taxes go up so although the province is saving money on one hand your property taxes your other taxes are going up because we're filling the gap but um homelessness so Leduc is a great example god i love mayor, mayor bob young we're talking about him all night get a lot of love today <laughs> mayor do. young is um, they totally stepped into the into the space of a shelter and they're completely municipally funding that shelter not their job that's a provincial responsibility but the the ring around edmonton doesn't receive any funding for homelessness it all goes to the city of edmonton uh i would probably should do this follow suit with mayor young we have oh, we do counts in, in St. we got over 100 ish homeless they're not they're invisible though they're kids generally they are couch surfing or they're sleeping in their cars uh, they're just or they end up in edmonton and Oh, that's the worst situation when you when you get a kid from St. Albert who's not streetwise in Edmonton, uh, they get sucked into a lifestyle that is just spiraling out of control downhill. So if you get them when they're young, we're trying to build a youth um, transition home in St. Albert to try to get those kids that are just get them graduated and get them a job. They can stay there for a year when they get kicked out of the house. We're going to go back to pride. A lot of the kids in St. Albert who are homeless are LGBTQ. Do you have? I'm putting you on the spot, no. but do you have stats? I've heard it's. I've heard in the, in the Metro Edmonton region, it's it's estimated that about two thirds, at least two thirds. I would say, yeah, of of kids experiencing homelessness. Yeah, are, are and LGBTQ I noticed you had out loud our, our our kind of our yeah. group in St. Albert on your show a couple of weeks ago, and they're fantastic, and they would have those stats for sure. They deal with it all the time, but it's again, it's just taking care of your own in in your own community so they have those supports nearby and it, it's it's unfortunate that they all end up in Edmonton or Calgary or now Leduc because Leduc stepped into the space and so has Wetaskiwin stepped into the space so yeah people can check this out that was that was two weeks ago it was uh it was our pride is protest episode and and you'll be able to find that uh anywhere you get your podcasts obviously in the real talk archives on on youtube as well and it was great that that group at out loud saint albert boy they got a lot of love for you by the way they, I love kind of, their yeah. eyes lit up when they <laughs> talked about you but it was neat because uh for people that missed that round table i'd encourage you to check it out we had um we the uh, have you heard about this rainbow refugees program mm -hmm. this was this was fascinating to me it's it's something that is like so obvious but it was flying under my radar which i think is kind of their point is that most people don't realize but but a lot of new canadians um refugees immigrants are coming to canada because they're fleeing or Uganda. exiting yeah you know na countries and cultures where you know so-called homosexuality is is punishable oftentimes by, by death, death or beating or persecution ostracizing i mean just everything um and i was just blown away by that conversation i was so grateful uh that we had three individuals sitting in the same seats that you three are sitting in talking about their personal experiences um you know like uh you know uh, being a person of faith and a member of the LGBTQ2S plus community at the same time. And there's a lot of reconciling that has to happen there. And I was really proud of those three that joined us. That was a couple of weeks ago, if Real Talkers want to look back to that. So we know by the numbers that about two thirds of Albertans polled feel that crime can be reduced. There's optimism here by investing in the supports that are needed uh, by the marginalized and the disadvantaged. Um, talking about mental health issues, addiction, homelessness, poverty. It's always difficult, though. It's a tough sell, isn't it? When, when you talk to people about how we can fix it, and then we know that that costs money, and then levels of government are going to say, well, it costs money. And then that, that, of course, nobody wants to talk about increasing taxes, 
province in a bit of a different situation than municipalities. Most people know municipalities can't run a deficit, so you got to crank up property taxes. It can be a tough sell. Not that people don't care about their fellow citizens, but it can be a tough sell, especially at a time where a lot of people are paying really close attention to their bottom lines. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things with municipal property taxes is that your councillors are, are the people making the decisions are literally right there in front of you. Um, so we hear about it a lot, right? No one wants to raise property taxes. And, you know, we receive the smallest share of taxation. And so it is it is all one taxpayer. It is one one person paying the bills. And when especially when it's things that aren't our jurisdiction, but because we care about the people that live in our communities, that we're obligated to step in. And so that's you know, when they talk about Leduc opening a shelter, we're tasked with opening a shelter and, and paying for it with municipal property taxes, that's not our responsibility. That's a provincial responsibility and, and they're essentially downloading that onto us. And and that's why we I think we really want to get this conversation going and, and like our campaign is it's time to talk because those funding things have real implications for municipalities and for our bottom lines and, and we're doing it to care for people. And is that is that our job? Well, we care about people, so so that's why we keep stepping into this. But I, I want to give a shout out to Sylvia on our live chat. By the way, she says another root cause that should be mentioned is poverty. Um, and boy, is that ever a good point? You want to talk about you know you, you can see direct correlation when the economy drops and you see what happens to rate uh, you know rate, uh, crime rates, uh, domestic violence. Tragically, is is another reality here. Um, we had an interesting question, uh, and, and I think it was Kathy that asked it. I, I apologize if I got that wrong, but she wondered uh, how much of the problem with staffing. I'm going to bring this back to, to policing for a second. It says how much of a problem with, with staffing or the number of officers on shift is related uh, to the province downloading the costs of police policing onto municipalities. Would you have some insight into that? I would say a, a, a lot of the staffing issues with RCMP date back to their contract negotiations. So they were they were uh, about 20% lower than municipal forces across Canada. So they were not getting paid nearly enough. RCMP weren't. They renegotiated their contract. They are now on par. So that, I hope, will attract more uh, people interested in RCMP and into deep depot. And the other thing RCMP are doing, again, modernizing, is they're not, they're sort of guaranteeing that you can stay uh, in at least your home province. Because a lot of people are hesitant to join the RCMP because they would be sent all over the all over the country. Uh, so I'm, it, the contract's what now, Trina, like two years old, three? Uh, Huge. Well, just, just shy of two years yeah. and the new one's being renegotiated yeah. right now. And of course that costs municipalities a massive amount of money. So I had to pay retroactive pay to uh, f uh, five years to my 70 officers, which is what two and a half million dollars. And then, of course, this, their salaries went up by 20 percent. So, again, it was a tax increase, um, property tax increase to every resident in St. Albert and pretty much across Alberta because of that. But I don't think the attraction has anything to do with the downloading onto municipalities unless you are. <laughs> Trina has a different take. <laughs> do you? Uh, yes and no. Um, we've heard from the RCMP, especially with COVID hitting them really hard. They can't get the recruits in for one because of the pay rate or the, the pay scale as it was, but during COVID they couldn't run depot. Yeah. So they were so used to running so many troops through depot every year and then they hit zero. Yeah. Um, now they're starting to recover from that and they're starting to put the troops through, so, which is good. So we may see those staffing increases come up. Uh, I guess Calmar would be in the same boat as I, as I am. Anybody under 5,000 people is under the Provincial Police Service Agreement, which means we now have to pay into policing as well, and that includes the counties too. So while our residents may not think it affects their daily lives, this year that's next to $48,000 I have to come up with in my budget. Yeah. Next year it'll be $76,000. We don't know where that's going to sit in a couple. Can of you years. give us a sense of like for for Legal's budget, how how big of a deal is seventy six grand? Uh, so one point on our mail rate is about twelve thousand dollars. Oh wow! So to in theory to cover that amount, we would have to raise taxes by three percent, which is huge for people. That's like yeah, that, like a three percent rate tax raise is like. You're starting to flirt with not getting reelected. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, just calling part, them how I see them. <laughs> that part I'm not so much worried about when I do that. Um, it's the affordability issues on my residents. You know, we're, we, we have to pay for policing now. Um, 
we're paying our medical first responders f to cover for the ambulance shortage. We have to cover snow removal. We have to cover the, our sewers. We've got a major arena project coming up. And it's all that snowballing that we have to cut back on because we're being forced to divvy up that, that pie. Uh, our, our $3 million budget in, for the entire town for a year, yeah. we're now having to divide that up into smaller and smaller chunks with only a certain amount of money. so That was the right answer, by the way. Nice job. <laughs> this is why you're a community servant and a public <laughs> servant and an elected, and I'm not. You know, I say, gosh, you might not get reelected. You go, I'm worried about the affordability of our families. I go, yeah, right, yes, <laughs> and, and that, <laughs> that too. Yes, no, your heart and, and your, your, your motivation is in the right place, uh, Mayor. That's great. If, if the three of you, I want to ask all of you, if, if we had to sit down uh, today with Minister Pete Guthrie, Minister of Infrastructure, um, we're having coffees or we're breaking bread where would that conversation start <laughs> that's easy we need more money no uh, so but <laughs> i say that in jest and and I, I get that the province hears that all the time from you know not-for-profits and from the school boards like there's always a demand for funding but what our association has done is we've justified it and i wish i had the numbers in front of me but you know, when, in 2010, when the Municipal Sustainability Initiative, which is our infrastructure funding, came out, it was about um, $300 per capita. When that when that is replaced next year by LGFF, it goes down to about $154 per capita. That's a 50% reduction in our infrastructure funding. Uh, and so we've we've tried to calculate what it would be if it if it remained at $300, factor in inflation and population growth. We think we need about $1.7 billion to fund <coughs> municipalities across Alberta um, on, on roads, on bridges, on rec centers, on, on new fire trucks, all of this capital infrastructure. We are only getting 722. So it's about a billion dollars short. But at least we can say why and we're trying to justify it to the province. So that would be my first conversation with the Minister of Infrastructure is LGFF, Local Government Fiscal Framework, our granting for capital infrastructure needs to increase 100%. No, no, de no doubt about it. We have a thirty billion dollar deficit in municipalities um, infrastructure in Alberta. Thirty billion. So when we're talking about that, like give give the average person an understanding of what you're talking about. So we're 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 talking about what we need to repair. Is it like maintain? aging sewer lines? Yeah, absolutely. Stuff, stuff like that. The stuff repair, that's not maintain, sexy. Maintain and replace. It's not <laughs> so sexy. Nice. That's why we never get funding for it. It's it's not like funding an arena in Calgary, it's tough to which cut is ribbons fun. on sewer line. Exactly. Yeah. But we need it. And if you're going to attract industry to Alberta, if you're going to attract doctors to Alberta, especially in the more remote communities, they pretty much expect their toilet to flush. <laughs> That's pretty basic. <laughs> and, and they want good water out of their taps. And they want fire response when their clinic is on fire. That's where the, the deficit's coming from. So the repair and maintain and replace the existing infrastructure. And then as we grow, we're going to need more fire halls. And we're going to need more swimming pools. And we're going to need more ice rinks. Like Trina said, she's got a big project in Legal. She can't fund it. So what happens? <laughs> she's going to have to go into debt. Uh, yeah, so we actually we were very successful. We got a $7.2 million grant from the feds. Uh, we are now trying to find another $2 million for our portion. Um, we are working with our hockey club, and they're applying for grants for us because we don't qualify for those grants, uh, which leaves us with another million dollar shortfall. And this is just replacement of a very old, very, um, very much falling apart arena, which is a hub of our community. Of course. Uh, so we would love to be able to spend $15 million, get the bells, the whistles, the whole nine yards, but just to replace what we have. It's not only gone from a $9 million project a couple of years ago when we started this, up to $11 million. It just inflation and, and costs. And, sure, and all material that kind of cost, yeah. But the other piece of it is the government canceled the Alberta funding or Alberta community funding, um, ACFA, anyways, uh, which was low cost loans for municipalities. So our 1.5% loan has gone to now 5.5%. Is this because, just so I understand it for the average person, is, is that because the, the provincial government with its deeper pockets has the ability and, and, and its credit rating to borrow money for cheaper? Is that kind of how that works? Basically. So why do you think, what, what's, your, what's your speculation or what do you know about why that was canceled? I, honestly, I'm not really sure. Uh, but if they reinstate that, 
they uh, maybe not reinstate the ACFA, but reinstate those low cost loans for municipalities, we can build our infrastructure. We can afford that debt for the $2 million sewer trunk line. We can afford to redo, reline our, our sewers. We can afford to build arenas. <laughs> it sounds like a simple fix. You'd think, but. This has been pitched to the province? Oh, absolutely, uh, constantly. And what's been the response? We're not looking at that right now. Uh. Minister Taves talked about risk. He was, he was talking about uh, the risk to the province. We have a new finance minister, so that'll be something we'll be pitching right away to Minister Horner about low cost. Because if they could offer us the low cost loans, that would save them probably on, on infrastructure funding. Because, you know, one way or the other, we're going to need their help. I want. We always want to like as we wrap a conversation like this. Um, you know, we know how people are listening to this, especially as we're into the summer, right? Like someone's listening to this on their drive out to the lake. Somebody's listening to this on their extended dog walk. Somebody's listening to this as they spin cast into the river, open to snag a brookie, and we wish you well on that. But we always like to give folks a takeaway something to walk with a call to action a way to contribute toward community building i mean i mean alberta municipalities here encouraging people it's time to talk so why don't we give folks a talking point because uh, they're going to be with their friends on this long weekend uh counselor why don't we start with you what's one thing that you'd like our audience members our viewers and listeners to be talking about with their neighbors and their community members over this long weekend you know, I think the really important thing here is is to be aware of, one, what your community actually needs, because I think a lot of times people aren't paying attention to uh, their sewer line projects or things like that, and For they're sure. not interested. <laughs> it's not sexy, like you said, but it's important. Um, and then to take those concerns and get involved with the government. So whether that's coming to council meetings and getting involved, whether that's going to your MLA and saying, our community needs this stuff, we need more money, but I don't think it can only be Alberta municipalities leading that charge. Um, we do, I know RMA has sort of gotten on board with our additional mil billion dollar ask, right? That they agree that that number is needed. Um, and so to take that to your local councillors, to ask them to get involved, take that to your MLA and ask them to get involved um, because we need it. And, it's, and it actually affects what you literally see outside your door. So, so taking that and, and being involved, it's a, I mean, it's a tough ask. I think people aren't really, <laughs> aren't really interested but we're not going to get it unless we can prove that there's the support there from the people, right? You know what, though? I see it all the time. I see that someone will all of a sudden, uh, I got to be careful. I was going to say have a fire lit underneath them. It's kind of the bad time of year to use that metaphor. But but like people can find motivation. You know, they listen to an episode like this or, or a friend tells them about something and they go, I had no idea. I didn't realize. And, th and then this is like these calls to action actually work. Uh, when you have an engaged audience, you have an engaged and, and, and passionate group of people i would say that alberta almost on mass qualifies as that you've got people that care very deeply about their communities and for a lot of people some of these issues are just flying under the radar there are some that slap you in the face right i mean you you, you describe the the trip into our studio and we're so proud to be located on purpose intentionally in the heart of downtown but you're right I mean, I talked about this to the Edmonton councillors the other day. I was dodging broken glass everywhere and, and quite frankly, a used condom in the middle of the sidewalk. And I know that that's not new and I'm not a pearl clutcher and everybody knows that. But, like, it's not ideal. Uh, you know, and we see, you know, stuff that sort of is right in our face and apparent. You know, we've got the, the, the kids' birthday party happening and, and then you see evidence all around you of where society's falling short and, and the dichotomy there can be troubling. But then there are also big issues that nobody knows about, that nobody really realizes. And that's why I'm so grateful uh, for these types of conversations, you know, because I don't take it for granted that there are people that will take action if they understand where they can direct their efforts. Well, we take, you know, it's Kalmar is, is interesting. We have two provincial highways running through it. Um, they're not our responsibility to maintain. Uh, we don't want to take on the financial cost of maintaining them. And when people get mad about the potholes, we give them the contact info for Alberta Transportation. Yeah. And they, they go there and they, and they write their emails because they're mad. Yeah. Um, and I think that if we can harness that in a variety of areas, you know, to be taking on some of these challenges, that people care. It's not just, it's not just Alberta municipalities doing that and, that and that we need the help. I think that that would be really, really important to get that fire lit. 
how great would it be to spend like a few grand on like election style signs and you could just put signs up by every pothole <laughs> <laughs> ticked off at this pothole email this address call this number that, right, that, right. that would be a really great yeah. flex uh mayor jones what's what's something you want people or you encourage people to talk about or, or spend a little bit of time thinking about over this weekend i think i, I love an educated public um so go through our plans look through our minutes look at everything we're up to and find what's important to you um talk about it with your friends have you know sitting around the fire pit this weekend thankfully we can have a fire this weekend yeah. but um find those issues that are going to affect you personally come talk to us learn about the issues and then you know help us help you help us <laughs> go to the, the the other levels of government with it I just got to think about that for a second. <laughs> who, who's helping who? We're uh, all helping each other. <laughs> yeah. uh, Mayor Heron? These guys covered it really well. Um, you know, federal government has all the money. Provincial government has all the power. Local government has all the problems. And I think those that, that distinction in orders of government, that's why I love the fact that we can come on your show and spend an hour talking about local government and sewer lines, which you is bet. Uh, it's really important. So as you're sitting around... Um, your Canada Day celebrations. That's it's Canada Day. I, I think just that recognition that that we're that we're the ones doing a lot of the work supporting those communities, and we need the, we need their help. You know, during the provincial election campaign, we tried to get our issues front and center, but they're just not sexy. Um, healthcare and sovereignty acts was was the big talk, and sewer lines weren't. Go figure. So that I think you know. Can I do a shout out? Well, totally do whatever you want. Totally off topic. Yeah. Because uh, while you were doing your your uh, your sponsors, mm -hmm. we need a Friesen Brothers in St. Albert. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's where I'm going with this. Yeah. And Mike lives in St. Albert. So yeah, you're talking about Mike I got a piece of land. Him. Yeah. Yeah. The COO. Yeah. He lives in St. Albert. You so got a piece of land for him? I've got land for him. Yeah, so you want to sell it to them, but are you are you saying, can I broker this deal? Yeah, so I'll I have a little. Tell Mike to call me. Yeah, anyway, I, I don't no. know if I'm allowed to announce there is a new Friesen Brothers. It's not in St. Albert. It's in it's in Andrew Knack's ward. Yeah, it's in Andrew Knack's ward. Yeah. I think I'm allowed to he, say it's, this. It's public. It's public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and the traffic was, circle on 142nd Street yeah. and 107th Avenue. I, honestly, I was in Stony Plain uh, for a meeting with Mayor Choi, and I stopped at Friesen Brothers. Yeah. Oh, it's now I'm talking like a sponsor. No, it was great. I, uh, I mean, we wouldn't. We we don't. We don't. Johnny and I have a rule. We don't partner with lousy sponsors. <laughs> we don't. We'll take a piece of that land, mayor. But we will take a piece of that land, mayor, because we, we Johnny and I have our own plans. But I think the final message is on this Canada Day. I think what we need to see, and this is not even municipal. It's just about being human. Is is uh, please please celebrate Canada Day. Like please sing the national anthem at some point on Saturday. And, and stand up to some of the hate that we've been seeing. Pride Month wraps up today. It's June, but that doesn't mean we can't still stand up to the people that we're speaking in Leduc or or get angry when somebody does a tire stand on your crosswalk. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think not just locally elected and, and those leaders in the community, we need everyone. Yeah. yeah the silent majority has to start becoming vocal. We and need it, a loud and it, majority. And it is the silent, overwhelming majority. Right? Overwhelming. Like how many people out of a thousand in anyone's given community do you think believe that the government is spraying trees to start fires and turn men into women? How many out of a thousand? One? Oh, less than one? I'd say less. Yeah. Like let's keep our perspective here and let's also recognize strength in numbers on communities. It's um, like a council meeting right out of Parks and Recreation. That it show. Is. That's, <laughs> that's what I was thinking the whole time yeah. it was happening. It, it's like if, if, if Parks and Rec, uh, yeah, if in like another universe, 100%. This guy right here. Yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Nice job. For those watching on YouTube, great reference, Johnny. I need to go back and watch that nice. show. This is one of the one of the uh, the handles that's been popping up more frequently in our live chat and I love it. Bunny Slipper. I don't know who this person is, but I love Bunny Slipper's take. They said this roundtable was all about facts, facts about what communities need. This is how politics should work. That from Bunny Slippers. What well, an endorsement for uh, Mayor <laughs> Trina Jones out of Legal, uh, Councillor Krista Gardner out of Calmar. Hell of a debut, by the way, on Real Talk. Love Thank it. You. Love it. No small <laughs> task to come in with two veterans yeah. and hold your own. You sure did. And, of course, the president of Alberta Municipalities, uh, she's the mayor of St. Albert, Kathy Heron. You can learn more about what it's time to talk about by visiting abmunis.ca. You'll find that link in our 
show notes. Um, these conversations happen, as Mayor Heron just said, uh, because of Real Talk sponsors like our good friends at Kubi Renewable Energy. And this is just a really good news announcement. If, if, if you're uh, an electrician, uh, maybe you're an apprentice, or maybe you've got your ticket, and I don't know, maybe this is speaking to one person in particular. Maybe you just got laid off. I don't know. Maybe you've been underemployed. Maybe you're looking for work. I'm thrilled to tell you that Kubi Energy right now is hiring uh, have you ever worked for a company before that has cold beer on tap and ball hockey tournaments on Fridays? Uh, that's Kubi. You want to work for a company? And by the way, not even lousy beer. They've got sea change on tap. How good is that? A company that provides investment matching? What? Yeah. How about one that's going to invest in your education and your career by offering training and assistance for everything from safety and equipment courses to trade school, engineering seminars, and post-secondary degrees? Wouldn't it be nice to work for one of the fastest growing companies in Canada at the forefront of the renewable energy industry, all while having the option to work or relocate across different cities in Alberta and BC? That's the reality. When you work for Kubi Renewable Energy, check out the careers link today at Kubi Energy. Energy.ca. And of course, you know what's going to go down tomorrow right here on this show. It's Trash Talk, our weekly tradition where you have a chance to blow off a little steam. We've got some fiery submissions. We have room for a couple more. You can send your rant to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Trash Talk is presented by our friends at Local Environmental Services. Whether it's disposal, uh, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's waste and recycling, the team at Local Environmental Services would love to talk to you if you're making decisions for a municipality or for a big or even small business in Alberta or Saskatchewan. They can meet you where you're at. They can grow their services as your business grows, and they can guarantee that you will pay less dealing with local than you will with those big multinationals. You can learn more and request a quote today by visiting visiting localenvironmental.ca. Coming up on tomorrow's episode of Real Talk, I'm not sure if you saw this or not, but more than 100 Alberta physicians co-signed an open letter to the provincial government. Quite frankly, they're pissed off about Dr. Dina Hinshaw getting fired and Dr. Esther Tailfeathers resigning as a result. They say we've lost two of our best and brightest. We're going to talk to some of the co-signers of that letter right here on Real Talk. Make it a great Thursday. We'll see you again soon. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson. Executive producer, Josh Dunford. Technical producer, John Hicks.